Democracy itself, I think, is a two-edged sword. Pure democracy, Plato would tell you, and so would Aristotle, is extremely unstable. And the founders certainly believed that as well. I mean, they were very cognizant of what happened to the Roman Republic. Um, and it's always in danger of tipping over into something uh, uglier because liberal liberalism also requires and liberal democracy requires certain virtues. From the McCourtney Institute for Democracy on the campus of Penn State University, I'm Michael Berkman. And I'm Chris Beam. And I'm Jenna Spinelli. And welcome to Democracy Works. So should we say our favorite line of the show, guys? We have a very special guest with us today. Um, in this case, we, we do, in fact. Uh, Andrew Sullivan, who is a writer at large for New York Magazine, former editor of The New Republic, founder of The Daily Dish, longtime observer of American politics. He visited Penn State to give a lecture on American democracy in the age of Trump. And I think we talk about some of those issues in the interview. It's exciting to have Andrew Sullivan here. I mean, personally, I've been, been reading Andrew Sullivan in for my entire adult life, yeah, actually, I, I starting guess. with the New yeah. Republic. Mm-hmm. And I love the Daily Dish. I thought it was uh, really groundbreaking in yeah. its use of the internet. Oh, it was. And, and it also it did killing him. So he had to yeah. stop. Yeah, he said it really <laughs> overworked him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and now I think his writing in New York Magazine has been really, really interesting. And, uh, you know, he's one of uh, many conservatives out there who have uh, strongly broken with Donald Trump, or in his case, he was never with Donald Trump. He was never with him, right. He was uh, from the beginning. Yeah, and I mean, it is interesting to kind of put him in that category. I don't think he is so much a anti-populist conservative. I think he is more kind of a, a, a Burkean conservative. And he's coming out of this English school with Oakshot and others that his his concern is that society, rule of law, civil rights, Democratic institutions, none of them are written in stone, right? They they can be taken away. They can un- they can disappear. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, he's, he's never called himself a conservative, yeah. a Republican, yeah, Republican, anyway. Right. And in fact, it voted for Barack Obama right. and yeah. George and, W. Bush. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. I mean, he he truly sees himself, and he saw Obama as essentially a conservative, right? But like like some of the others that we've some of we've had on the show, like David Frum and others who we haven't, but talk about uh, Bill Kristol and and. Uh, Wilson and some some of these others, he is uh, really concerned about the effect that uh, the Trump administration is having on liberal democracy. But I'd go more broadly than that and say that he's very concerned about the state of liberal democracy around the world. Yeah, Absolutely. not not one of our more optimistic guests we've ever had on the no, show. That's right. I mean, yeah. probably on the contrary, one of the most pessimistic. He sees democracy as coming in two types, right? He sees it as coming in liberal democracy and illiberal democracy. Yeah, that's a, that's a fairly common. And Actually, this be, is something we've talked about right, quite a bit with right. Orban and some of these uh, European examples of moving towards an illiberal democracy. And well, that's and what he sees happening he's here. He's a liberally educated product of English school system. And he knows Aristotle and Plato. And he knows that both of them argued that uh, democracy is almost inherently going to move toward this Ill- illiberal, inevitably going to move to this illiberal form. Yes, yeah, so And so the shocking achievement, and I think he would argue that that's what it is, of the American um, It's how founding. long it's persisted. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And that we've been able to achieve yep. this democracy that is not going to fall into tyranny. Yeah, and what I think he's done really effectively in his work, and that I hope Jenna pulls out in the interview, is that he has a, a really nuanced sense of the conditions that are leading people, not only in the United States, but around the world more generally, to to move away from liberal democracy and to be supporting populist kind of authoritarian leaders. Yeah, I think absolutely we're in this moment and it is worth considering what it is about the world right now that has created this moment. Well, let's let's go to the interview. And yeah. we'll come back and uh, we could probably talk about some of these ideas about what, what's going on in the environment today that makes the ground so susceptible to authoritarian All right. populists. Sounds good. Here's my interview with Andrew Sullivan. Before we get to this week's interview, I wanted to take a minute to tell you about our sponsor on Democracy Works, the Penn State World Campus and its Psychology of Leadership program. Sharing responsibility, empowering others, looking forward, motivating from the head as well as the heart, building trust through collaborative decision making. Is this the type of leader you want to be? 
then apply for the master's program that will get you there, the Master of Professional Studies in the Psychology of Leadership, offered entirely online by Penn State University's World Campus. Learn from talented faculty with top academic credentials and professional experience. Learn from other students from diverse backgrounds and industries. The Master of Professional Studies in the Psychology of Leadership at Penn State allows you to be the leader you've always wanted to be. Learn more about the Psychology of Leadership program at worldcampus.psu.edu slash leadership. Again, that's worldcampus.psu.edu slash leadership. And thank you to the World Campus for supporting Democracy Works. Andrew, thank you for joining us on Democracy Works. I'm incredibly psyched to be here. Thank you for sure. having me. Sure. So you are here at Penn State today to give a lecture on American democracy in the age of Trump. You write about democracy frequently. You've done debates on democracy. Uh, you know, and it's it's a term that, that at least in, in our experience kind of invokes something different for everyone. Some people think about norms and institutions. Others maybe conjure fairness and equality or, or individual freedom, these kinds of things. Um, how do you think about democracy in your work? Well, I think there are two core types that I think about. And one is liberal democracy and one is illiberal democracy. Democracy itself, I think, is a two-edged sword. Pure democracy, Plato would tell you, and so would Aristotle, is extremely unstable. And the founders certainly believed that as well. I mean, they were very cognizant of what happened to the Roman Republic. Um, and it's always in danger of tipping over into something uh, uglier because liberal liberalism also requires and liberal democracy requires certain virtues. It requires the ability to have a deliberative conversation, to use reason as well as emotion, but reason is the core function of it, and openness to other ideas and toleration of radically different worldviews than you within the same culture. And that's hard. It's really, really hard. It's harder than we think. It's very hard for humans, for example, to assume someone's innocent before they're presumed guilty, especially when they look extremely guilty and there's evidence against it. Um, so liberalism is, in that sense, in liberal democracy sense, is deeply uh, counter to human nature. Illiberal democracy is really the empowerment of the majority over the minority, usually through um, a single leader or a single party that, that takes control of a particular society and government. Yeah, and so we've it seems that we've seen a, a transition throughout the world from liberal democracy to to illiberal democracy. Um, what what I know you you write particularly about the the U.S. and the the U.K. What particularly concerns you in this this moment? I think that it is human nature in fast changing societies and fast changing economies, and the world is changing extremely fast to seek security. Democracy, its promise is not ultimately security, it's, it's freedom. And there are moments in history where freedom is more popular than, than non-freedom. And I think the massive migrations across the world and the globalizing of the economy has created the seeds for the need for not having every view represented and not being tolerant of everything and actually stopping things that might otherwise be associated with liberal democracy. Mm -hmm. And charismatic leaders tend to do this. They can do this within constitutional democratic systems. So you see someone like Netanyahu who has been operating really as the indispensable figure in Israeli politics. Or you look at how Viktor Orban has emerged uh, within what's supposed to be a democracy that's within the guidelines that the EU presents. You see in Britain, obviously, Brexit breaking through and really putting the entire constitution and liberal democracy through a stress test. It's, it's a troubling situation right now. It's still, it's, liberalism is still holding on. More worrying is the fact that in the world of ideas and discussion, the ability to have a real exchange of views between different people is becoming harder and harder because people feel so emotional about these things and are polarizing into different tribal factions. And that inevitably also encourages illiberalism because it reveals fear of the other side. When the other side's arguments aren't just wrong but threaten you or seem to be threatening you directly, 
you tend to have a different response to who should be in power and whether power should be properly shared between different parts of the community. Yeah, so thinking about those kind of threatening feelings, we've seen that, you know, make America great again and take back our country, that kind of Brexit slogan, there's certainly a nostalgia element there, but it also seems that there's maybe an element of, of reclaiming dignity, maybe. Do you think that it's essential in, in a democracy for everyone to feel some sense of, of dignity or, or like they are a valued part of the system? Yes, I think one of the eternal human demands is meaning and usefulness. And I think large numbers of people in the West, especially those who are unskilled, who've earned their livings in the past by rather honest labor, but aren't educated or intelligent or in the new media, I think they're confronting the fact, and it's not that they're inventing this or imagining this, the fact that they're not really needed anymore for the economy, for the society. And that's a terrible thing to feel. And the transition from being something a, like a welder or somebody who actually produces something, a value that might actually have some quality to it that you could feel pride in, or a profession which you can identify with, all those kinds of jobs have begun to disappear, placed by automation or very low-skilled, very low-paid, undocumented aliens. And that's clearly presenting a crisis for people. I think they've simultaneously, we see a decline in religion and that also helps people keep it together. You see across the West, but especially in the U.S., a huge crisis in opioid addiction in these very communities that feel that meaning has disappeared. So yes, I do think, and the sense too when they watch the media, that they're not really part of this conversation or they're not the cool part of the culture. And the, I mean, how many sitcoms do you see now that feature a white working class family? I mean, it used to be quite common. You go on HBO or something, it's all super hip, wealthy, or at least upper middle class people. And a lot of people increasingly don't recognize themselves and their lives in the broader culture and also see the meaning of their lives being reduced by economic and social forces. And one of those meanings is nationalism. I mean, people attach themselves to a country and its history and its identity and its nature. And that's an important part of their identity and their meaning. Americans very much so, so to the Brits. And if they see, for example, their country changing demographically, racially, culturally so fast that they no longer fully identify with it, then the crisis becomes even urgent. Someone coming along and saying, I actually care about you. I know what you're going through. I love this country like you do. I'll fix it all is incredibly attractive, especially when so many of the other elites are quietly saying, all oh, these people, you know, they're really just racists or bigots or xenophobes. They're deplorables. They're pretty useless. Screw them, essentially. Or more beneficently, kind of ignore it. That's why Donald Trump has staying power. And it's why Brexit was such a, an incredible moment in British democracy, in which many people who had never before participated in democracy came out in that referendum. That referendum to leave the European Union had more votes than any previous general election. Massive turnout. And many of those people had never voted before, as I said. So these are very stirring and important, profound things. And the ability to sustain liberal democracy in the face of those kinds of forces, really tough, unless you're really vigilant about it. Yeah, yeah I was going to ask, does democracy have the capacity to respond to some of these big sweeping challenges you've just described? One can certainly hope so. It's certainly been rather resilient facing other crises. But the last time we had a major, huge global economic crisis, the 30s, it didn't do too well. And liberal democracy has also been, I think, held up somewhat by the generations who still remember that and don't want to return to it. But as generations emerge who don't remember that at all, liberal democracy will see, seem like as if maybe we should do away with this. And that's why I'm concerned that younger generations seem to have much less support for democracy than older generations because I don't think they see very clearly what the alternative actually is, and it tends not to be good. I mean, democracies are actually better at adapting than authoritarian societies uh, to change. But authoritarian societies can arrest change more successfully. They can seal off a country. They can make it so that they're more resilient against it and that the changes that are happening elsewhere don't happen there. Like in Hungary, for example, there's just no immigration. It's just stopped it. Yeah, and they could shut down the press and the, the courts and universities and all these, these kind of institutions. Yes, and no worse, they take over the press. 
or their or the universities they have favored ones and less favored ones you can use the instruments of government not to rip up all the institutions of liberal democracy but to make them kind of fake so liberal democracy exists the freedom first amendment here is still in force we have lots of different radio tv channel stations but what's happened is that they've tribalized and they're not actually talking to one another and so the practice of liberal democracy which is the practice of exchanging views maybe even being corrected or correcting someone else or even learning something from this conversation but you have to be in in the spirit of it and the spirit of democracy is important so for example censorship we're not in this country talking about the government preventing people from banning books or preventing people from speaking but we are talking about an increasing trend in civil society voluntarily it's all just no one's breaking the law in this of crimping certain views or stigmatizing them excessively in regarding them off bounds for discussion or even describing the people who present those ideas as somehow morally problematic as opposed to just wrong or misguided and that also undermines and erodes the liberal virtues that are actually necessary to sustain the institutions you do need a liberal culture for a liberal democracy to function yeah, yeah, and it seems like there's like kind of so on the one side there's people on on the left who are talking down to to Trump supporters, and then there's people on the right calling people on the left snowflakes. All of these things that kind of go back and forth and back and forth, and it's like neither side seems willing to to blink or to say to to, to come forward and and say no, guys, we need to like think about this in in in, in a different way. Yes, because I think their identity has become bound up with this. So. If you're wrong, it's not just you're wrong, but you're somehow sort of cancelled or you're kind of a bad person or somehow you're being forced to be someone other than you are so that these identities, these political identities, ideological identities are becoming very personal to people. And I think one of the reasons that that has happened is social media in which people who otherwise would not have been voicing their opinions anywhere, who don't really know very much about things, but get up in public in front of their family and friends at least – and commit themselves to a position. It might be stupid, but they're stuck with it then. It's in public forever, and they then have to defend it. Now, if they made a stupid argument at Thanksgiving dinner and made a fool of themselves and embarrassed, then everybody forget about it, and no one will bring it up again. The subject would change. But social media makes everything more fraught and everything eternal. So people get locked in to these particular positions in a way that they just, if they were to concede anything, their psyche would be threatened. So there have been, it seems, efforts to reform democracy kind of, kind of around the margins, maybe. There's, there's states that are doing things. I think you can maybe point to uh, marijuana legalization coming up, you know, state by state by state. And there's, you know, groups out there doing everything under the sun from trying to get money out of politics to ending gerrymandering, all of those things. Do those kind of smaller marginal changes matter when there are these kind of so, like, bigger structural problems of, of liberal democracy happening on the, the national or maybe even the, the international level. Yes, they do. Because liberalism is also about the maintenance of rules and norms and institutions that keep a, a society free and open. And what you saw, for example, in the decline of the Roman Republic was small, tiny little breaks in tradition that suddenly created a new baseline for future actions politically. So the minute a consul, for example, overstays his term limit because of some emergency or some question, suddenly the whole idea of term limits is open. And the next one will be three years until you get someone with six years as consul, which is laying the grounds for someone permanently in control, maybe, if that's the essential question. So actually, liberalism, you know, it, it's challenged because it, it has an empty center, America, you know, there's not some God we all worship, and that's the basis of our entire society. It requires an emphasis on process rather than end. It's, 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 it's as concerned with means as it is with ends. And I do think, especially in periods like this, keeping the norms in place, like not allowing certain things to slide, is actually incredibly important. That's why Trump is so dangerous, because he has no understanding of norms and cannot obey anything outside of his own psyche. And so is a kind of psychological wrecking ball for these norms and institutions. And 
is permanently damaging the possibility of liberal democracy surviving in this country. Equally, however, those on the far left who regard most Americans as white supremacists and patriarchal sexists and homophobes and all the rest of it, and will not tolerate anybody who pipes up and says anything contrary or finds, for example, religious fundamentalists an intolerable presence in our society who have no right to their own religious freedom if they in any way imperil the, their leftist project, they too have a problem here. And, you know, it, it, partly what happens then is both sides are afraid of each other. Once they get power, they will use it against the other side. And then they start losing faith in the rules. And that's where we're getting to. Is the parliamentary system better at, at keeping norms in place? I think so, actually. Certainly executive norms. Because when the executive isn't a rule unto itself, such as in Britain, for example, what we have right now in Britain is a parliamentary majority against the ruling government. It's a very particular situation. Usually, before the Fixed-Term Parliament Act of 2011, the minute a government didn't command a majority, it went, and we had an election. It got a new one. But Parliament comes first, and the executive is relatively powerless because the sovereign operating body is the queen in Parliament. So it's a fusion of the executive and the legislature. But here, where we've created an independent presidency with his own prerogatives and his equal co Prequel, uh, but separate part of the political institution, you have the possibility and potential for far greater executive mischief. Does it say anything to you that the, the Republicans are seemingly so much in lockstep with, with Trump right now, as opposed to that not really being the case with, with Boris Johnson? Yes, but I think in both cases, there is a very solid base of support around very basic emotional issues. And I think that Boris Johnson's just emerged through the parliamentary system. He is a creature of that system. He's been brought up in that system. He's a classic elite prime minister. So he's not this demagogue from outside that Trump is. So that particular feeling that people have, and it's a feeling, not an argument, the feeling that they voted to leave and therefore if they don't leave, the elites will have foiled them. And that makes people angry. And I under, actually, I understand that particular position. If you have a referendum where you say this is it and one side wins, for that side not to get its way, even three years later, is a problem. But the problem is that the intensity of the attachment to that position is too great to be subject to compromise. Similarly with Trump, Trump has what is similar but different because it's more dangerous and more fervent, is a cult, is a demagogic cult leader who has a grip on his followers, around 30% of the country, and a, a large majority of the Republican base that will follow him anywhere, that will agree. I mean, for goodness sake, they've agreed to support Russia. Republicans have agreed to end their commitment to free trade. Republicans have committed to any number of complete reversals because Trump, the supreme leader, wants it that way. And so there you have complete irrationality operating, or rather complete emotionalism operating, which he is brilliant at manipulating and stirring and keeping at a boil. So yeah, that means that that, that kind of polarization and that kind of commitment and passion, 30% uh, of the country who will not budge at all on for any reason whatsoever can clog up the entire democratic system, prevent it from operating. Yeah. So what what what's the best way in that cult-like scenario? What What is the best way to, to try to get through to the extent that you can any ideas other than the ones that, that they're receiving from from President Trump or from media sources they're consuming, those kinds of things? Well, I think it's happening. I mean, I think there's plenty of criticism and resistance. We have a majority of the country in favor of impeaching the guy, a majority. He has historically had the lowest approval levels of any president, although at this point in their terms, Reagan and Obama weren't far away from where he is. But they had started much higher and therefore had some a higher ceiling, whereas he seems to be stuck where he is. But no, I think it's the only way to really counter this is to have a political opposition that is commanded by a charismatic and able person who is capable of dissecting and explaining why this person is out of line and offering an alternative. And as somebody said, that already happened in 2018 with the Democrats taking the House. The question is whether there is a person who can rival Trump in terms of his magnetism and dynamism. I mean, the man is has an energy that's, that's really a function of his own psychological illness, but is nonetheless frenzied energy. 
hard to know how to how to cope yeah. that. Well, and, and I think you mentioned too that the way that he's able to, to connect with people. So if you look at his tweets, for example, you know, people can kind of make fun of them for being misspelled or have, you know, having things capitalized and they shouldn't be all these kind of things. But if you go to, for example, a, a restaurant in any small town in America and, and look at the menu or the signs, that's, that's how people talk. That's how Yeah, and when people are telling Trump that he's not good at English, you're telling all these other people yeah. there. They identify with him in that way. But also the way he speaks, the language he uses, which is very straightforward. Politicians and the elites in this country have learned to speak in certain ways that they don't even realize they're doing that just most people don't talk about. Like, um, how many regular Americans go around saying, um, I met an LGBTQ plus person the other day? Of course they don't. It's absurd. But that's the rhetoric they will get from the Democrats all the time. That kind of thing, which seems utterly alien to them. And so they, they start disengaging. They don't see anyone they can identify with in the, in the Democratic elites. Yeah, I guess thinking about that, that idea of, of dignity we were talking about earlier, I mean, there has to be some sense of balance there, right? So, if, you know, someone who is trans, for example, they they should feel the same level of dignity and, and, and respect that somebody who is a, a straight white man feels. And I think that that's partially, too, where we, we kind of find ourselves at, at loggerheads, so to speak, just trying to figure out what, what that, that balance looks like in yeah, and within the capacity of human nature. Mm-hmm. But the way to get past that is to talk to people as a human being and explain how you came to be who you are and why it's different and why you understand why they might feel a little weird. But after a while, they need not. They, you can feel the attitude in that as opposed to, I'm trans, you're a bigot, and it's not my job to talk you out of it. It's your job to educate yourself. <laughs> you bigot, educate yourself and then come to me and talk to me about why I deserve everything. And that's just, you know, even if it were at some higher level true, it just doesn't work politically or culturally. And it's, and it's, it's not respecting those people in the same way that there's, those people are not respecting the trans person. Does religion factor into this at all in terms of uh, people uh, maybe having through through their faith, ha- having some of these the traits of, of, of humanity and, and kind of understanding people for who they are, respect these, these types of things? Yes, except I would say that one of the problems we have is that secular people increasingly are not just secular and not religious, but are hostile to religion and believe religion is somehow the source of a great deal of evil. And when people's lives are focused around their religious identity, that can come off, does come off as hostile. I mean, I think one of the reasons that Trump's base is so solid and why so many evangelical Christians are in it, despite the fact he is probably the least Christian person I've ever come across in my life, is simply because they feel under siege by secular society. They feel that they're going to be prevented from, for example, following their faith on the questions of homosexuality or abortion without being discriminated against by their own government. That's why they're obsessed now with religious freedom, because they genuinely feel under threat from from these people. And to some extent, the rhetoric has shifted on the left to outright hostility and contempt for religion in some cases, not all, but some cases. And so, yes, I do think, and I think also the fact that more that religious people are more concentrated there's a higher sort of proportion of them in the heartland than in the urban centers, that it comes self-fulfilling in a way. You, your religion is backed up by the environment you're in, just as your atheism is backed up by the environment you're in. And it, it comes to a point where you can't even understand who the other people are. Yeah. Do you see a, a connection between what, what you've just been describing about religion being such a such a intertwined with the other parts of your identity? And and also, I think you, your, your other... Another argument you've made is that in the absence of religion, people are turning to politics to kind of fill some of that, that yeah, void. I do think that at least some element of the cult behind Trump is a sort of semi-religious fervor that you don't doubt. You just trust. You throw your faith into it. And I think also that essentially the social justice movement as it now is, is a sort of cult around identity. Um, which gives provides all meaning to these people's lives and therefore can brook no compromise whatsoever. That makes it so hard for liberal democracy to work. Tribalization is a huge problem for liberal democracy. And the founders never really quite thought of it that way. But it may be that that's the Achilles heel of this system. We've got this kind of big knot of, of liberal democracy. All these things are kind of bound together. The economy, the tribalization, 
uh, the you know kind of the, the cult figures, uh, all of this, and it seems like there's maybe a, a decision paralysis about which which to attack first, right? When everything is on fire, like how do you move forward, or or is there kind of one one place that it it, it makes sense to to start, or one thing it makes sense to kind of focus on first? The rule of law, as simple as that, really, and constitutional norms. Uh, you must defend them against these forces that want to undermine them. The other thing is simply the force of moderation. Again, people don't appreciate the role of moderation in the bringing about of liberal democracy. Liberal democracy emerged as a response to religious warfare in which groups of people, again, consumed entirely with their own cult, their own religion, could not tolerate living with another and therefore fought for hundreds of years and creating incredible damage. It was the moment when Western Europe decided, you know what, we just don't think it's worth it. Let's just live and let live. That was when liberal democracy began to emerge. If we replace, if we go back to uh, these warring religions, whether they be political or actually religious, then we're back to what liberal democracy was supposed to solve. I am not an optimist. Uh, Liberal democracy is alien to human nature. It's existed in a sliver of human history, like a few hundred years at most, in only a few countries with a particular culture, and not really what most people find emotionally satisfying. I hate to say this, but I think it's kind of done in this country. I think we will go from charismatic, authoritarian leader to another. And we'd be lucky if we can get uh, alternating groups. I think the discourse is going to be very hard to repair. I cannot say at this point that looking at the culture, the forces of moderation, of liberalism, of toleration are in any way but beleaguered and besieged. This has been a crisis and an emergency since day one. And the reason I'm pessimistic is that a liberal democracy that was healthy would have recognized that immediately and marshaled against it. And yet these other forces have come in to shore it up. So a lot depends on what happens in the next year and a half. But I'm not optimistic. Yeah. Well, Andrew, thank you for, for shedding light on some of these issues. Um, I, I think that I know, maybe the, the first step is understanding the problem. I think you've certainly helped us, us diagnose it here today. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. So, Michael, I heard a lot in, in that uh, interview that resonated with, with kind of our introduction, right? The idea that there is, at one and the same time, both these conservative, uh, this conservative understanding of kind of the limits of human nature that are inescapable and universal, and then also this idea that there are, there's something distinct and absolutely scary about where we are right now. Yes, and you know, one thing that struck me with him over the course of... Uh, the day that we spent with him when he was on campus and in his interview is more so than a lot of the people that we read and have talked about on, on the show. He, he has a real sensitivity, I think, to uh, the supporters of Donald Trump and supporters of populist authoritarians more broadly. Well, yeah. They, in, in that he sees how larger social forces might be leading them to abandon liberal democracy. Or at least to be open to something else. Be right? open to I open mean, to something some else. Some of this kind of strikes, you know, sounds is driven by desperation, this feeling of being threatened, and he does have a pretty good sense of that. Right, but he talks about it at multiple levels, right? He talks about it in terms of economic change, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and uh, we often forget. But you know, large scale economic change brings about with it large scale political change because right. political system has to adapt to new types of economy. It had to adapt to the service economy. It had to adapt to the manufacturing economy. Yep. And now it has to adapt to this more automated economy, to service, an economy where, right, where, economy. right, where many people's sort of labors are no longer as valued or needed as they used to be. Oh, and manufacturing can chase labor at much lower prices than Americans can legitimately. Work. You know, this is a pretty dramatic change in the American economy. And what what Andrew Sullivan focuses on is what does this mean for people that used to have jobs, right, right, or used to do things in the old economy? Where are they left, David? Well, one thing he said that I thought was really, I, I really agree with, and but I hadn't thought of before. He said, democracies respond better to change, but authoritarians are better at arresting change. And if you hate the status quo, 
And if you are feeling threatened by where things are going and you want things back the way they were. Like there's, to make America great again. There's something very, if I mean, just taking that as a stipulation, right? He's right about that, that argument or that distinction. Then there's something very rational, right? That's a good, that's a smart choice. If that's where you are and, and this is where you see your threat, this isn't just acting out, right? This is a reasonable assessment of your choice and, and choosing what you see as in your best interest. But, but he recognizes, too, that it, it's, it's not just economic change. Of course not. That, not even close. It's also the cultural change. Right. It's, it's the sense of being left behind in your own culture. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, the world kind of moving on and, and you're not moving on with right. it. Right. I feel like there's this, for Sullivan, there's, I remember in one of his New York Magazine articles, he basically just says, everybody get a grip. Right. And, and so on the left and on the right, there's this presumption of threat on the part of the other that just makes not just dialogue, but living together very difficult. Well, this is I mean, we've talked about this in different ways, but this is the alignment of identity and partisan right. identification that has so. So when you say something against somebody against the other party, I mean, it's almost like they're just part of another team. At well, this and, point, their identity is wrapped up in their party and in who they are. Well, and I think he said this in this interview, but he said it while I was here, that for followers, supporters of, of Donald Trump, there is this kind of cultish dimension that where any criticism of him is understood to be a exactly. criticism of, of me. Yes, including this idea that all the misspellings and that type of thing in his tweets, that might just be a way that he's identifying with right, people. Right, right. Or that people identify with him. And so if you critique him for his spelling, which if you follow Twitter, Never. every time a Trump <laughs> tweet comes out, then, you know, all the people that are smarter than he is comment on how he misspelled the word moat and he misspelled mm-hmm. this. And Andrew Sullivan is arguing that's just playing right into his hands because people who support him then see this as an attack on them. I think he has a really astute understanding of what leads people to, to, to this kind of support. So the other part that I think we should talk about is just how pessimistic he is, right? And how, I mean, what does he say? That, that we may be done? Something like that, right? Yeah, he calls it the end. I, I, did he say it in the interview or certainly in his he talk here? It, he talked about the end of liberal democracy. Yeah, he said the task is beyond us, maybe. I think it's kind of done in this country. And that is the most negative assessment that we've heard here. But I do think he's right that, you know, we've said it before on the show, that democracy makes demands of us as human beings that are difficult and, and unnatural. And that if we, that we have to start by recognizing that fact, right? And by saying, if you want democracy, if you want to sustain a democracy, then especially among the people who are, are college educated and who are among the cultural elites, you need to accept these demands. And so there is, he does say explicitly that there has to be this set of, of democratic virtues, virtues that set a standard for our behavior and a standard for excellence that, we have, that we're supposed to not just accept but live up to. And, and there's nothing, I mean, it's almost like this is the price for admission. If you want your democracy to be sustainable, this is what you're going to have to commit to, that you're going to have to accept the fact that people aren't going to agree with you, that you're going to hear things that you don't like, that you're going to express your point of view without getting personal, without getting enraged and emotional, and that you're accepting as a kind of point of beginning that the person you're arguing with, the person you disagree with, loves their country, loves their kids, and is basically a a good person. Yeah, I mean, he makes this argument in in different ways that, uh, and, and this is a guy who loves to argue. Mm-hmm. Right, more more so than almost anybody. And does it very very well. Does it very right? does it very very well, and you know really sees a, a role and sees a necessity in a in a democracy to have reasoned disagreement and space to do it. As is not unusual when Andrew Sullivan writes something or says something, it generates a lot of discussion and argument. And and and, uh, and, and that's why he is just so interesting and so read and followed by so many people on the right and the left. Because Absolutely. even when you disagree with them. He, and maybe particularly then, he's, he's worth uh, reading. What I often find is I go in disagreeing with him and come out thinking, oh, I'm not really sure. Maybe yeah, I, I maybe kind of I do agree with him, but, and, uh, certainly but not his, about some of this. And certainly his model for um, democratic argument is one that 
is is worthy of emulation by anybody. I don't care and, who. And you one are. which he demonstrated while he was on campus, right? right. In multiple discussions, right? With right. People. I yeah. mean, we can we can disagree vehemently and still be thoughtful and decent towards each other. Yep. All right. So on that note, thanks Jenna for a great interview. Thanks Andrew Sullivan for coming to campus, and uh, thanks to all of you for listening. I'm Chris Beam. And I'm Michael Berkman. It's been Democracy Works. Thank you.